Chapter 4 We stopped again early in the evening. Earlier than the Magus wanted, he grumbled, but agreed to look for a campsite after watching me nearly slide over the back end of my horse at one steep spot in the trail. As soon as he chose a place to stop, I dismounted and collapsed in the prickly grass. I lay there while the Magus directed the unpacking of the horses and listened as Ambiades carefully and condescendingly instructed Sophus in the construction of a cooking fire. I turned my head to watch. Haven't you ever stayed out overnight hunting? Ambiades asked, looking at kindling tightly stacked in a poor imitation of a campfire. Sophus cast an embarrassed look at Pole. Not alone, he said. Well, your highness, Ambiades teased. If you stack all the wood one piece directly on top of another, it won't burn. The fire suffocates. Imagine how you would feel if you had all that wood stacked on top of you. Watch. He dismantled the pile and built a pointed hut of sticks with the skill of much practice. <clears throat> Make a house and the fire lives in it. Make a grave pile and the fire dies. Understand? Yes said Sophus humbly, and stepped aside to allow Pole space to cook. I didn't move until the food was ready, and Ambiades came to nudge me with his boot. Magus says, get up and eat something, O oh scum of the gutter. I heard him, I said as I rolled over and pulled myself to my feet. Tell me, I said over my shoulder, O oh source of all knowledge, have you figured out the difference between a fig tree and an olive? He reddened, and I went to eat my dinner satisfied. After dinner, which was skimpy, the magus pointed to a bedroll and said it was mine. The sun was still high in the sky. It wouldn't reach the horizon for several hours, but I rearranged the blanket and lay down. There was a heavy cloak to cover me while I slept. I ran my hand across the finely woven wool. It was dark blue on the outside, like the magus's and was lined with a creamy gold color, like a barley field, before harvesting. There was no embroidery, but it was carefully made. I would need it as the heat of the day faded. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the magus watching me finger the wool, like a tailor assessing its value, or like scum from the gutter touching something he knows he shouldn't. I turned my back on him and let him think what he wanted. The other four continued to sit around the fire, and the magus had left plant classification behind and was quizzing his apprentices on history when I fell asleep. The next morning before noon, we reached a small farmhouse that was sitting in near ruin at the end of the trail. Its whitewash had faded, and its plaster had dropped off in chunks, revealing the lumpy stone walls underneath. A man came to the doorway as we arrived in its weed-grown yard. I expected you last night, he said to the magus. The magus glanced at me. We moved more slowly than I expected, he said. Did you get the provisions? Everything, said the man. There's fodder in the shed for the horses, enough for two weeks. And if you don't come back this way, then I'll take them back down to the city. Good, enough said the magus. He opened one of the saddlebags and raised himself on his toes to look inside. He pulled out the leg iron I'd slept in at the inns and then sent Ambiades and Sophus off with the horses. Pole and I followed him into the house through the empty main room to a back room that had windows on three walls and held several narrow beds. It's too late to start up the mountain today, the magus said to Paul as we went in. We'll stay here and start tomorrow morning. You, he said to me, should be able to rest to your heart's content. He had me sit on one of the beds and knelt to lock the cuff around my ankle. He tested with two fingers to make sure that it wasn't too tight. I forgot to get any padding, he said. You'll have to live without it until the boys bring in the saddlebags. 
he looped the chain through the bed frame and pulled on the cuff to make sure it wouldn't slip off my heel. Then he and Paul went away. I shifted the cuff into a comfortable place and wondered if the dent formed in my ankle would be permanent. The room was cool. None of its windows faced south and by the time the mages returned to wrap my ankle in one of Paul's shirts, I was asleep. I spent the day dozing. Sometimes I sat up to look out the window above my bed at the sunlight, falling bright and hot outside. Once I saw Paul teaching Ambiades and Sophus to fence with wooden swords, but it could have been a dream. The next time I sat up, they were gone. After dinner, I lay and listened to the voices in the other room. The sky grew dark, and the stars came out. I was asleep again before the moon rose, and didn't stir until Sophus told me that breakfast was waiting. There was an overfull bowl of cooked oats, and another bowl of yogurt, as well as bread and cheese and olives and several oranges, the small lumpy kind that are hard to peel, but juicy and sweet. Enjoy it, said the magus, seeing that I was. You won't eat so well again for a while. I ate what I could and didn't complain about anything. When the magus asked me if I could please not chew with my mouth open, as I had been doing assiduously since our first meal together, I obliged him with a visible effort. Paul worked on my wrists, pulling the stained bandages off, cleaning the blisters, and rubbing more salve into them. I didn't try to wiggle away, and I produced only enough curses to let him know that I could have made more noise, but was refraining. The sores were already much better, and I concurred when he decided to leave them exposed to the air for the day, although I could see that it didn't matter if I concurred or not. It was lucky that I hadn't gotten sick in prison. If I had, it would have taken more than three days of food and fresh air to make me feel so well. While the maid just directed the filling of backpacks that everyone but me would carry, I stretched my muscles, bending down to touch my toes, leaning over backward onto my hands, checking to see how much of my strength had returned after a day of rest, and wondering how much longer I had before the maid just needed me fit to work. Then I sat on the stone threshold of the house and waited while the others shouldered their burdens. In front of me, the mountains began in earnest. They lifted above their foothills with a rush, their stony slopes dotted with tenacious bushes that had found a hole in loose shale. Sticking out like the bones and ankles and knees were solid outcroppings of limestone and marble. Anyone could see that the rubble piled on top of the steep slopes made the mountains nearly unscalable. The perfect defense for Edis, the country hidden in the valleys near their summits. There were gorges carved by water, and somewhere there were quarries, but I wasn't sure where to look for them cut into the mountainside, because I wasn't positive where I was myself. Somewhere inland of the Seprachia, was all I knew for certain. The mayor just called me away from my stone threshold and led the way up the hill beside the house to a narrow crevice sliced in the side of the mountain. The trail that had been no wider than a horse the day before was no wider than a man and barely visible. We walked along an old stream bed, probably dry for most of the year. When swollen with rock winter rains, the stream had carved its way through the shale and slate with more difficulty, but just as inevitably through the marble and granite. Where the water flowed, the olives had taken root. The mountain walls rose on either side of us, sometimes in solid stone walls several hundred feet high. The red shank and green shank grew in scrubby clumps they left dry scratches on our skin as we brushed by. When the track occasionally ended in a small cliff that would be a waterfall for the stream in the rainy season, the Magus looked for footholds on either side of the stream bed and always found them. We ran into no impassable obstacles, 
although we climbed over fallen tree trunks and sometimes scrabbled uphill on fingers and toes. I was happy to have my soft-soled boots. We stopped for lunch before I'd exhausted myself, but I was glad to rest. It was clear that the magus meant to lead us up the stream bed until at some point we left Sonus and entered the mountain country, Edis. Maybe we already had. I hesitated to ask, but I was delighted when Ambiades did. Where are we? Edis, since that last climb. Why? My eyebrows lifted. So the Magus hadn't told his apprentices where we were going. I wondered if he'd told Paul. The Magus turned to Sophus to ask, What did you learn about Edis from your tutor? So Sophus recited what he knew while we ate our lunch. Edis was ruled by a queen and a court of eleven ministers, including a prime minister. Its main exports were lumber and silver from mines. It imported most of its grain, olives, and wine. The country was narrow and ran along the top of the mountain ranges to the south and southeast of Sonus. It sounded like a paragraph from a book describing all our neighbors or something equally simple-minded. When Sophus was done, the magus turned to his senior apprentice. Tell me what you think are the most significant facts about Edis. And Ambiades performed admirably. It made me think he had some aptitude for his training, though I'd gotten the feeling that he thought his apprenticeship was somehow beneath him. Maybe it rankled that Sophus was the son of a duke, and he wasn't. Edis controls the only easily traversable pass through the mountains between Sonus and Atolia, the two wealthiest trading countries in this part of the world. It has the only remaining timber industry on this coast. All of our forests have been logged. They don't have many other natural resources in the mountains, and they get most of their wealth as a result of other people's trade. Edis taxes the caravans that go through the mountains and sells her lumber to Atolia and Sonus for merchant ships. Because she depends on trade, she has always been neutral and tried to keep the peace between Atolia and Sonus. After we drove out the invaders, we would have invaded Atolia, but the Edisians wouldn't let us. Very good, said the Magus. He turned to Sophus and asked him if he knew about that incident. When they took apart the bridge across the Seprachia, Sophus guessed. Yes, said the Magus. It runs through a gorge, and without crossing the gorge, an army can't get down the far side of the pass into Atolia. They were cowards, and they knew they were safe in their mountains, said Ambiades. He spoke confidently an opinion held by most Sunesians. Why would they have let Sonus through if war would hurt trade? I asked, forgetting that I re risked rebuke by intruding on the conversation of my betters. Even Sophus knew the answer. Because the Aetolians had lied. Edis let the Aetolians bring an army through the pass when the invaders first came because it was supposed to fight on our side. But instead, the army helped the invaders overrun us at the siege of Salonis. So after all that time, Sonus was out for, for revenge? Several hundred years seemed like a long time to nurse a grudge. Most people find it galling to lose their freedom, Jen, the magus said dryly. The remark passed over Sophus's head, but Ambiades laughed. I said, yeah, but Edis didn't get overrun, did it? The invaders never conquered them? No, said the magus. The invaders eventually overran Atolia as well as Sonus, but the rule of Edis has never changed hands at the instigation of an outside force. That was the end of the conversation and of lunch. We went back to our ascent. Twilight came mercifully early on the deep ravine of the stream bed. Our party slowed down once we could no longer see to place our feet reliably. Paul helped me along and I had to take a hand from Ambiades as well. Finally, we came to a wider area of the trail and a flat space that had served many travelers as a camping spot. 
someone had built a stone fireplace against the wall of the ravine, and the granite above it was blackened by many fires. After dinner, when our bedrolls were spread out on the ground behind us, we sat around the fire, and Ambiades asked again why we were in Edis. The mages answered with another question, which Ambiades answered patiently, obviously used to this response to his inquiries. What do you know about the rule of succession in Edis? Well, they have a queen, like Atolia, so the throne can't descend only in the male line. I suppose the rule is passed from parent to child, just like Sonus. And do you know if that has always been true? Ambiety shrugged. Since the invaders. And before? Are you talking about Hamiathe's gift? Ambiades caught on quickly. I am, said the magus, and turned to Sophus. Do you know about the gift? Sophus didn't, so the magus explained. It's not surprising. Sonus and Atolia long ago converted to the invaders' religion, and we worship those gods in the basilica in the city. But once, we all worship the gods of the mountain country. There is an almost infinite pantheon, with a deity for each spring and river, mountain and forest. But there is a higher court of more powerful gods ruled by Hephaestia, goddess of fire and lightning. She governs all the gods except her mother, the earth, and her father, the sky. The reign of Edis supposedly arose out of one of the stories in which Hephaestia rewarded a king named Hamiathes with a stone dipped in the water of immortality. The stone freed its bearer from death, but at the end of his natural lifespan, the king passed the stone, the stone to his son and died. The son eventually passed it to his son, and the possession of it became synonymous with the right to rule the country. When a usurper stole the stone and soon di thereafter died, it was understood that the power of the stone was lost unless it was given to the bearer, and so a tradition grew up that allowed the throne of Edis to change hands peacefully when another country might have had a civil war. One person stole the stone and then gave it to his chosen candidate for the throne, in that way making him rightful king. But this is just a myth, protested Ambiades. I silently agreed with him. It's hard to say what is myth and what is real, said the magus. There may have been a king called Hamiathes, and he may have initiated this tradition. We do know that there was a stone called Hamiathes' gift and that at the time of the invaders, people still believed in its power and its authority. So much so that the invaders attacked Edis to gain control of the country by gaining control of the stone, which was additionally rumored to be some sort of fabulous gem. When the gift disappeared, the invaders were thrown back off the mountain and returned their attention to Sonus and Atolia, which were more easily administered countries. What had happened to the stone? asked Sophus. It had been hidden by the king of Edis, and he died without passing it to his son, and without revealing its hiding place. It has remained hidden ever since. Do you think it could ever be found? Sophus asked. The magus nodded. There was a short silence. You think you can find it? asked Ambiades, his face pinched with eagerness, and probably greed, I thought. The magus nodded. Do you mean, I squawked, that we are out here in the dark looking for something from a fairy tale? The magus looked at me. I think he'd forgotten that I was there listening to him lecture his apprentices. Reliable documents did survive from the time before the invaders, Jen. They mentioned the stone. And you really think you know where it is? Ambiades persisted. Yes. Where? he asked, while I shook my head in disbelief. If it really exists, why? I asked. After hundreds of years, are you the first one to locate it? I'm not. The magus's answer surprised me. According to the records I've found, a number of other people have gone to look for the stone, 
but those who came closest to where I think it is hidden never came back. This makes me think that in at least one way, they were poorly equipped. He smiled benignly at me across the file. Traditionally, it took an exceptionally talented thief to bring away the stone, and that's why you've been invited to grace our party. Would those records you found be the ones you think survived since before the invaders? Things that old, I'd have to see before I believed in them. Yes, said the magus, hooking his linked hands over one knee and rocking back and forth in self-congratulation. Although they survived no more, once I elicited the in <clears throat> excuse me, once I elicited the information I needed, they were destroyed to prevent anyone else from following the same trail. I winced. It would have been better if the records hadn't been discovered at all. Ambiades asked again where we were going. You'll see when we get there, said his master. And why are we going? I asked derisively. So that you can be king of Edis, a hopelessly backward country full of woodcutters? It was the most charitable description of Edisians that I had heard in the city. I will give the stone to Sonus, of course. He will be king. I will be the king's thief. This pricked my professional pride. I was going to do the stealing, and he was going to take the credit. His name would be carved in stone on a stele outside the basilica, and mine would be written in the dust. I reminded him that it was my place to be king's thief. Or do you expect me to hand you Hamiathe's gift and then get knifed in the back? Is that why you brought Pool? He didn't rise to my bait and pulled in so much as shift his weight on the far side of the fire. A little chill ran up my spine. That won't be necessary, said the magus coolly. No one would mistake you for anything but a tool, Jen. If a sword is well made, does the credit go to the blacksmith or to his hammer? How much smarter than a hammer can you be if you flaunt the proof of your crimes in a wine shop? I flushed, and he laughed. If I hadn't already been hung angry, it might not have seemed unkind laughter. What would you do if you were King's Thief, Jen? Chew with your mouth open in the royal presence? Chat with the court ladies, dropping the H's at the beginning of your words and garbling the ends of most of them? Everything about you reveals your low birth. You'd never be comfortable at the courts. I'd be famous. Ho. Oh. You're that already, Jen, he said pityingly. I'd have been amused myself if Ambiati Snicker hadn't rubbed me raw. I changed ground. And Sonus trusts you to bring the stone back to him? Of course, the magus snapped. I'd hit a sore point. He'd made sure that Sonus had to trust him, destroying all the records so that no one else could locate the stone. Are you sure? I needled him. Maybe that's why Pole is along. Maybe you're the one to be knifed in the back. His eyebrows flattened over his nose. He was angry at last. Don't be stupid, he said. And why should Sonus be king of Edis as well? He already has one country, I said. And all they have up there, I waved to the mountains behind me, is trees. A lot of trees. Does he want to build boats? No the magus explained, remembering that I was hardly worth being angry at. He wants the queen. I dropped my mouth open in patent disbelief. We're doing this so that he can get married, said the magus. Edis has refused him so far, but she won't be able to if he can show that he is the rightful ruler of her country. We've warned her that at his next proposal, he will be the bearer of Hamiathe's gift. And that's why we were all out in the dark, fetching what he had already promised to deliver. What if no one believes in your silly Hamiathe's gift anymore? I asked. What if we find it and everyone says, so what? She is not so secure on her throne, 
that she can risk offending her people's gods. No woman could be. I looked into the fire. For a while, there was quiet around the campfire. He doesn't want the queen, I said at last, the truth forcing its way out. He doesn't even want the country. He wants the pass through the mountains so that he can invade Atolia. Paul and Ambiades nodded their heads on the other side of the fire. To anyone who knew Sonus, this explanation made more sense than the one the magus offered. The magus shrugged. It's not important why he wants the gift. What's important is that we get it. And now I think you'd better get some rest. Like a good tool. For instance, a very well-behaved hammer. I stretched out by the fire and went to sleep. The next morning, light came slowly to the gorge. I was well rested by the time our day started, but the conversation of the night before still rankled, and I took care to chew with my mouth open at breakfast until the magus winced and looked away. The gorge grew wider, and the olive trees disappeared. We walked past juniper and red shank and green shank bushes and the occasional fir tree as the stone cliffs were replaced by steep hillsides covered with loose rocks. Finally, in the evening, the gorge widened still further, and we were in a narrow valley filled with trees. The path underfoot changed from hard rock to dirt, and then to dirt covered with pine needles. We made no sound as we climbed out of the valley into a larger forest that stretched indefinitely in front of us. I told you there was nothing up here but trees, I said as I turned around to look at the way we had come. I could see down the cut of the gorge until the trail twisted, and between the mountains I could see all the way out to the plains beyond. The road we had followed to the foothills was not visible, nor was the city, but we could see a bend of the Seprachia twisting across the plain, and beyond that there was a glimpse of the sea. Can we stop now? I wanted to know. My feet are tired. No, the magus shook his head. Get moving. Our trail continued between the trees. We made no sound as we walked and walked. I looked up at the branches that blocked any view of the sky overhead, mountain fir, with their cones beginning to open in order to drop their seeds. I said, this is boring. How come boring makes me so tired? When no one answered, I asked again, When can we stop? The maid just slowed down to look over his shoulder. Shut up. I just wanted... Paul was behind me as usual. He leaned forward to give me a shove in the shoulder blades. It was almost dark when we came to a road through the forest, paved with giant stones, laid perfectly evenly, we waited under the trees until the magus was sure that the road was empty, and then we all sped across to the forest on the other side. Where does the road go? Ambiades asked the magus. From Edis' capital city to the main pass through the mountains. How did they lay it? Sophus wanted to know. The magus shrugged. It's been too long to know. It was laid at the same time as the old walls of our city. No one knows how it was done. Polyphemus, said Ambiades. What? asked Sophus. They probably think Polyphemus did it. He was the giant with one eye that supposedly built the old walls of the city and the king's prison. Don't you know any of these stories? Sophus shook his head. My father thinks that we should forget the old gods. He says that a country with two sets of gods is like a country with two kings. No one knows which to be loyal to. The track continued on the far side of the stone road. We followed it into the trees until the sun set behind a bump of mountain. The twilight lasted while we set up a camp just off the trail, and Paul made dinner on a small cook fire. The pine needles provided easy kindling. While we ate, I picked at the magus. I liked to watch him lose his temper and then regain it when he remembered that I was supposed to be beneath his contempt. When he and Paul tried to plan how to make up the day we had lost at the mountain house, 
I told him that if I had wanted to move faster, he should have had a cart for the early stage of the trip. Before I was done with my dinner, I asked for seconds and complained that he should have brought more food. I talked with my mouth full. You don't have to carry it, Ambiades pointed out. Yes, said the magus. Maybe we should have you carry your own share tomorrow? Oh, no, not me, I said. I'm worn out just hauling myself up here. I lay down on my bedroll and wriggled on my backside until I could put my feet up on the trunk of, the, of a fallen tree. Why didn't you bring something more comfortable to sleep on? The magus started to answer, but Sophus interrupted. He asked the magus to tell him more about the old gods of Edis. I thought your father didn't want you to hear about them, said Ambiades. Sophus thought for a minute. I think he just doesn't want people to believe in them, to have superstitions. I don't think he objects to an academic interest. He doesn't, Ambiades laughed. I thought that an academic interest was exactly what he objected to. Didn't he threaten to throw you into the river tied to a stack of encyclopedias? Even Paul laughed as Sophus blushed. He doesn't think I should spend so much time on book learning, but he thinks it's all right for other people. There was a little silence at the fireside that I didn't understand, to judge by the look on Ambiades' face. Whatever it was that bothered him had come upon him with a vengeance. To fill the silence, the magus told Sophus he would teach him some stories of the old gods. He began with the creation and the birth of the gods, and he didn't do such a poor job. I lay on my back and listened.